Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to be breaking ground on our 420 Hemi engine swap. Or in other words, we're fixing to put a bigger lawnmower engine in our street legal go-kart. If you're new to the channel, then go ahead and keep watching. But you'll also want to check out our previous episodes where we experiment with the 212cc engine and get our little car up to some amazing speeds. Anyway, for now, just sit back and enjoy the show. Well there it is. It's hard to believe this rig is less than a year old and also has less than 500 miles on it. Looks like it's seen better days. Now back in March of 2020, this is what the fresh engine cradle looked like. Anyway, let's take a closer look at our old engine cradle and I'll walk you through some of the changes that we're going to be making. Now here's a shot of the bottom. This cradle's seen about a half dozen modifications in order to get the car drivable. Most of the mods were clean, but some were just downright hacks. My major concern moving forward is to fully sort out the chain drive and chain slack adjustment system. You see, the system's very sketchy at best, mostly because it was hacked together at the last minute. It works, but it has a lot of issues. The idler sprocket is adjustable, but it won't actually hold an adjustment for very long. Now the chain is another problem. You see, it's nearly impossible to lubricate the chain. The problem is, any sort of oil on the chain will get flung out and contaminate the CVT and the pulley system. About the best I was able to do was to shoot some dry lubricant on the chain, and that doesn't really work. This area here was hacked due to a miscalculation. The problem here was, it's impossible to swap the sprockets in and out due to the support bearing being too big. Basically everything has to come apart to change the drive sprocket. Now this oil was a bit of a mystery, but I finally figured it out. Let's take a look. The fuel pump operates off pressure pulses that are generated in the crankcase. You can see the hose that connects to the crankcase leads right up to the fuel pump. And you guessed it, the hose not only provides pulses, but it's also an avenue for oil vapor to escape. Over time, the oil just drips out the bottom of the fuel pump. Oh, squirrel! So this is the bottom of the fuel pump, and right here is where the oil's dripping from. We might have to do something about this in the future. What are you looking at? I thought the squirrel was more interesting. Anyway, now that I have your attention, do me a favor, click on the like button and go ahead and click on subscribe. And don't forget the notification bell. You see, the more humans that are subscribed to this channel the more interesting projects we can provide. Thank you. That was weird. Anyway, let's do some more digging. The first thing we'll need to fabricate is the new transmission adopter plate, and this will probably be the hardest part of the whole build. Here's what the coupling system looks like, and as you can see there's not a lot of space between the aluminum adopter plate and the transmission input hub. That's because the bell housing on this transmission is very shallow. Now I've already laid out some of the basic guidelines on the new adopter plate. This is so I can trim the aluminum plate down to a manageable size. So first we'll cut off all the excess material. Then we need to locate the center of the plate. We'll be using the input shaft of the transmission as center and reference everything from that point. This green line defines the upper edge where the angle iron cradle will mount. Now it's important this line be level so the lawnmower engine sits level in the car. And we'll get back to this a little bit later. This shot gives you a better idea of what I'm talking about. So the hole in the center of the plate will initially be drilled to 15 millimeter. Now that's because the transmission input shaft is 15 millimeter and the plate will center on the input shaft. After we finish the adopter plate, the 15 millimeter hole will get blown out to about two inches or 50 millimeter. Yeah, and then we'll drop some 5 16 holes to secure the flange bearing. So let's get started and trim off the excess material from the aluminum plate. This should be fun. This might seem somewhat unorthodox, but I like to use the table saw to cut aluminum. The process can be messy and dangerous. A shot of WD-40 helps lubricate the carbide tip blade. Mostly the danger is from flying shards of hot aluminum, but I do have a shop vac connected to the saw, and most of the debris will get sucked right into the vacuum.
So now we're going to finish off the center hole to 15 millimeter to match the input shaft of the transmission. Just doing a quick fit check. Alright, so now we have to level the plate so the rest of the cradle system will be oriented correctly. So this line needs to be level, and then we can clamp the aluminum plate to the bell housing. And that looks good enough. Now I'm going to use a carbide tip scribe to trace the bell housing pattern onto the aluminum plate. It's always good to do a double or triple pass to ensure the scribe marks are deep enough. You'll thank me later. I went ahead and used the transfer punch to mark all the bolt holes. Then we'll go ahead and drill the pilot holes. Now before we can start cutting the adapter plate, I need to drill a few relief holes. These holes will allow the saber saw room to change direction. And today we're going to be using Makita 21 tooth metal cutting blades. Nothing special about these, except they ain't cheap. I'm using a newer Porter Cable Saber Saw, and eh, it's nothing special. However, the old ones were really nice. The only feature on this saw I really like is this doohickey. I reckon it's some sort of zigzag thingy. Anyway, I'm sure that's not very helpful. This part's incredibly boring, so we'll only watch a few seconds. Now, the only thing I wanted to say was, you want to use plenty of cutting oil. Don't be shy with it. It took about two hours to cut this plate. Anyway, let's check the fit. And it looks good. Now let's drill out the holes. Yeah, <laughs> you should probably use a clamp or something. All right, let's see how this fits. Not bad, everything seems to check out. The center hole can now be enlarged. Alright, next up is the large flange bearing. Now this is going to take some effort to make it fit. This bearing was designed to use half inch mounting bolts, but unfortunately for clearance reasons, the largest we can use is 5 16 So we're going to go ahead and use this aluminum stock to make some bushings on the lathe.
0.625 works out to be about 5 eighths of an inch, which is going to make for a perfect fit. Now go ahead and make fun of me. I broke my parting tool about 10 years ago. Eh, Hexo works just fine. After each bushing was cut, then they were trimmed flush on the lathe. Not bad for a few minutes of work. I reckon you could also buy these from McMaster Car. For now we'll put the bolts in from the front, but eventually they need to be installed from the back side. Get in there! Alright, so that fits pretty good. So next up is going to be the shaft coupler. For the shaft coupler, we're going to mate the hub from this clutch disc to a 1 inch axle flange from a go-kart. Now in case you're wondering, the axle flange is a standard 4x4 four four inch. So we're going to need to liberate the hub from the rest of the clutch with the drill press. I like to use decent quality carbide drill bits because the crappy titanium ones never seem to last. On this coupler, we're going to try something different. Now in the last coupler I made, I welded the clutch hub to the axle flange, and that worked out pretty good. This time around, we're going to bolt the clutch hub to the axle flange using the already installed wheel studs. The new method we're going to try is probably more difficult than just welding the two parts together, but it's something I want to try. Now either method requires some trimming on the lathe, so let's go ahead and take care of that. Now we have a nicely machined inner hub. All we need to do now is match the clutch hub center to the axle flange and both of these parts will be centered to each other. To make the system work we'll need some custom spacers. Now I could make them out of aluminum, but I think we'll do them in Delrin. Mostly because my brother thinks Delrin ain't going to be strong enough, so let's prove him wrong. The last thing we need to do is trim a little bit off the nylock nuts. Now these nuts are supposed to be grade 8, but they seem to cut pretty easy. Hmm. So now we have all the parts to assemble the shaft coupler. The Delrin spacers go in first. Now we can slide in the clutch hub. And that's actually a nice fit. 
Now keep in mind both of these hubs are centered to each other and the Delrin spacers just take up the slack on the edges. Just in case, we're going to use thread locker on these nylock nuts. Let's chuck this in the lathe and see if anything looks wacky. Nope, it's within the thousands or so, and that'll be fine. One more thing to check, and it looks like we still have plenty of clearance. All right, well, let's go ahead and put some of this stuff together. We'll start with the adopter plate, and it slides right over the shaft coupler. Nice. We'll use this head screw to lock the coupler to the bearing when we do the final assembly. Probably use a bunch of Loctite, too. So next is going to be the one-inch go-kart axle. Drops right in. Next is a spacer. Now I got these spacers at Tractor Supply, and at some point we're going to need to trim them to the correct length, but that's down the road. Alright, so next comes the sprocket, and just so you know, it will need a key, but for now we'll just fake it. And then comes another shaft spacer. Of course we'll need to trim this one as well. And finally, the support bearing. Okay, so that's the hard part of this project, mostly because of the machine work that's involved. Now I'm not one to draw up plans and do critical calculations, I just build stuff and most of the time it works. Anyway, I think we're out of time today, so stay tuned for part two. Next time on Robot Cantina.